Ian is here. I invited Ian. Uh, we met through Jerry. Um, he's interested in he's interested in framing, so that's uh, for me. That for me is really nice. Uh, he's looked a lot at tooling for frame identification, and um, I think there's a convergence with the work Sonny's been doing on uh, clustering of um, clustering of materials in general. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious if that will be a topic, but does anybody else have agenda items? I don't have anything in particular. I'm just uh, currently revamping my homepage, so nothing major, I guess. <laughs> Again, do you, want, do you want to add to anything I said? Uh, yeah, I can share my screen. I mean, I don't have anything super concrete to present, um, but I can work on making a presentation for, for next month because it was kind of very short notice. Um, but I've been investigating framing and I come from a microbiology background and in microbio, there's a bioinformatics tool that I'm not sure maybe some of you have, have heard of it, NCBI BLAST. And it's a, a massive database of genetic and protein sequences, some of which are annotated, some of which are not. And my idea was, well, I read George Lakoff's book about moral politics, metaphors and framing. And Berkeley has done some work on making an annotated list of frames as well as their dependencies and their relations and that turned into framenet and i think there's a a global framenet now where different teams have frames in different languages linked up to each other and the the idea was well there are 1200 roughly frames in, uh, in the current frame database, at least for the, the English version. And there's maybe 20,000 lemmas. And obviously with protein alignment, maybe there's a dimensionality of 20 for, for each sequence um, or each uh, space in the, the sequence. I, I don't know how to, I don't know if I'm using the correct terminology here, but the dimensionality is a lot higher because you have 1200. Um, and, but the, the, the general premise is, well, if I can align sequences based off of their structural similarity, you can track the evolutionary relationship over time of specific frame sequences, let's say in speeches or in books. And then the idea was, well, how do I track these patterns? And then um, in Free Jerry's brain, there was also the um, discussion of, well, how do you, how do you see the um, convergence of frames between different disciplines and how, how could you link people together? Uh, there's also work that's been done by meaningalignment.org. They um, came up with a tool to essentially do ranked choice preference on wisdom, as in here's a specific context, a specific complex problem. What do you recommend or what do you suggest an AI recommender tell a person who's asking the AI this question? And they'll solicit, okay, what's uh, what's a story behind why, like why did you make this recommendation? And then what experience did you have that led you to make this recommendation? And then there's a series of what they call values cards. And these values cards have attentional policies listed on them. So in a specific context, here's what I focus on as a person. And you can then compare people's suggestions in a specific context by presenting a person this person changed their attentional policies from this to that um, after they were exposed to 
this this new set uh, did they become wiser yes or no or unsure then they ask okay why did you say that so it's like um i'd say it's pretty good at refining the um the problem statement and the the context so that's a way to survey and intake new information and you could also combine that with a mixed methods way of soliciting new frames because obviously language isn't static so if you have this pre-existing database it needs to be open for for further development um, and i was also introduced to uh the canonical debate lab which um doesn't directly focus on the the frames but i think the frames are a part of it so that's mm -hmm. um i wanted to share mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm rambling, but I, I, I am. Uh, I, I'm absolutely. Uh, I think this is all really interesting, but I want to make sure myself I'm understanding some of what you said. We had a long conversation two days ago, by the way. Yes. Um, the when you say uh, I had a quick look. I didn't have time to study in depth, but I had a quick look at the value alignment thing. And let me try to phrase my understanding, and you'll tell me if my understanding is correct because it's still I'm still trying to get it. Basically, given situations, mm -hmm. you would say, I would prefer this action to that action because of this moral criterion. And yeah. then you would say, is this moral criterion a, ba a better basis for discrimination than this other moral criterion? And you try to rank moral criteria in how they help you judge situations. Is that what's yeah. happening? Yes. Excellent. But that I, I I'm glad my my is that does that make it clearer to others what's happening there? I think it's really interesting. It's really encouraging yeah. people to go meta. That is interesting. And so when we're saying frames here, because Mark Antoine, you and I have talked about logical frames. These are not the logical frames. frames. This is more like how do you frame a question, just the context around a question is it more that type of frame or the george lakoff version of frames so there's there's a frame of mining right there's a frame of um disease there's there's different elements that people use to relate things and then a, a combination of frames would be viewed as a metaphor so an example of a metaphor in the lakoffian sense would be um war is business for example and interesting the of that so like, linking, yeah linking for a frame is a micro context in lakoff's uh, idea and in a micro context you have context appropriate heuristics and then the metaphor is saying you can apply the heuristics of this micro context to this other micro context yeah it's, i will to Sorry. Um, you mentioned uh, FrameNet, I think, uh, that has like a database of frames. Is there a way to like see individual frames there? Or yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, let me let me drop that link just to help understand, but, I guess. But the, the FrameNet frames are much more micro frames than the lake of frames. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say, and, and that's the thing. Fra frame, frame is a very polysemic term. I think there's a common unity to all these definitions, but for me, the, the argumentation frames of Walton, the Lakeoffian frames, which I, I, I have huge respect for the work of Lakeoff, uh, the frame that they're at different granularity levels, uh, but they're all. This is a kind of typical situation and you try to understand things in terms of that typical situation. Uh, oh, hi, Jack. Uh, is there something common to all those? I think so. I think it's the, there are instances of the same meta uh, metadata structure, uh, but it's not absolutely obvious how to translate between these different frame systems. Uh, I think it's it's clear to me that some frames in some systems have subframes. 
uh, which may be in the same system or another system. Like when you have this frame, you can infer that this other frame, perhaps from a more micro level, is part of it. And I think the micro frames will be key to finding bridges between macro frames. But that's just an intuition at this point. Okay. The, 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 one thing you said, Ian, which I, I also find extremely interesting, and I think this is close to what CDL is about, is you were speaking about the uh, uh, microbiology. Uh, now, I think the use of frame in microbiology is a bit different. A frame is just, in a way, a section of DNA and you can find a repetition of the same section so, elsewhere. So yes, Am I right? in microbiology, there's a there's a frame shift, um, which is essentially um, DNA is is read in uh, three nucleotide blocks by the the tRNAs, which translates it into um, the amino acids or the protein, right? But um, Different uh, promoters, for example, can um, have different three segment uh, lock on points. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm describing this very well, but say you have a, a sequence of ABA, CCC, um, ABA, you know, you could have that be your. Um, The promoted. start of the sequence. Yeah, you can yeah, start yeah. the sequence. The ribosomal binding site, for for lack of a better word. But sometimes the 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 ribosome doesn't bind uh, to that exact sequence. There's maybe some wobbliness, some wiggle room available, and you can then have it start at um, if the sequence was A B A C C, um, you could do B A C as the, the starting point. So this is going to change the uh, the proteins which are expressed so you can get a completely novel protein or function based off of a frame shift. And I, mm -hmm. I, my intuition says that you could frame shift narratives because different people, they have different attentional policies when they're reading things. So I guess this could account for the, the whole death of the author concept because people have different attentional policies. So they'll be familiar with different frames and therefore, it's possible to create writing which has different effects based off of who's reading it. Um, mm -hmm. And the establishing profiles of um, at people's attentional policies, I think, could be correlated with what, uh, what frames they respond to um, or what frames they're biased to. And then you could construct frames that bridge in a smarter way, I think. Very interesting. I, I wouldn't personally use the genetic frame shift as a metaphor for this, but where I totally agree with you is that when we interpret language, we interpret it using different frames depending on our repertory, personal repertory of frames, and that is partly personal, personal history, partly communities we belong to when we identify with, and being able to understand that the same statement will be interpreted totally differently by different individuals and communities is fundamental to uh, hopefully improving uh, quality of conversation. And I think it's what you're talking about. But what I wanted to point out is you were speaking also about the databases of molecular genetics. And yes. The idea that can we, and that's been a question we've been asking a lot in CDL, can we give to statements a kind of uh, non-arbitrary uh, canonical signature so that we can do um, you know, a unique, uh, if two statements are saying the same thing in slightly different ways, we would find that 
it can be canonicalized to the same signature and hence it's the same statement even though it has a different form. So I don't know if that's possible. It's certainly something we've been banging our heads against a lot. Uh, in the case of genetics, it's uh, certainly, uh, you know, language is given. Uh, in the case of expression, people come up with new expressions all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think the genealogy instinct is really interesting there, saying, can we trace how this statement evolved from this other statement, for, for how this frame evolved from this other frame? So rather than trying to achieve full canonicality, can we look at a genealogy? of statements and, and, and as a way to guide, uh, you know, decomplication. I, I, I don't have a clear answer there, but definitely something I'd invite us all to, to, to explore. Certainly for me, frames are part of the canonical signature aspect, but the, the, the actors in the frame, uh, the concepts themselves, some of them we can, are, are clear individuals and we can give them unique identifiers if we want to. Uh, others are ideas, hence inherently ambiguous, hence there's going to be a multiplicity of identifiers. There's no way to close the, identif the identifier set, right? but that's another story. I think there's a way to get close to it with um, def definition lattice. That's something we didn't discuss a few days ago. Uh, a lot of concepts, I think, can have a signature made of what are the distinguishing definitional elements in terms of more consensual concepts. Uh, so there's a, a way to approach canonicality of concept definition that way, uh, using using a lattice, uh, a feature lattice representation. But this I'm hand wave. I know I'm hand waving a bit. I think it's a path to a solution that's not a full solution yet. Jack, interpret through lenses. Yeah, lenses are frames. I think they're distinct. But but seeing a lens is composed of the frames we use to decode what happens, I think is valid. Um, the uh, Yeah, uh, seeing a lens is built from frames, is, I think is, is, is an intuition I want, I would want to pursue. Yeah, I, I, I like to use the term lens um, because it, it's kind of like a perspective that you put on a flow of, of resources through. And so there's little, that, that lens defines the pattern recognizers that are, that are busy and and some of them will fire and some of them will not and so you might use several lenses if you're making machine reading but the, the point is is that that they tend to be filters for what you want to see and 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 they will grab the frames that you want to grab and ignore the frames you don't want to grab that that <laughs> Yeah, th there's another meaning of lens in computer science, which is a two-way transform between two data structures. I was hoping to use lens to say, oh, this frame translates transparently to this other frame through this lens, or, you know, maybe with some lossage. Uh, but the uh, that is another usage of frames, uh, of lens, sorry, of the word lens. But I, I know, I see what you're saying, and I certainly don't disagree with the substance the well the two are, are are actually fairly close because you're 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 taking an input stream and essentially transliterating it to what you want uh which is the other side so in a sense what the computer science definition is close to what i'm talking about like if you apply a person's like perspective as a lens then like the output of that is like what they actually see in the thing they're looking at that's my uh, point yes yeah. and, you know yeah. a, an optical lens is going to distort the crap out of something in the distance <laughs> make what's close very 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 bright uh, etc whatever however the lens is it so 
So, but we're not talking physical lenses that literally distort the view. We're, we're simply talking about computer science and filters. Yeah, but, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make is there is, basically there's these specific len micro lenses that say this frame can be matched to that frame in this way. And there's the kind of overall filter, which is a perspective, I'd call that a perspective myself, which is saying these are the lenses are used because these are the frames I understand. So I'm using these lenses to interpret whatever message using the frames I'm familiar with. I like that a lot. The perspective being a collection of micro lenses works totally well for me. Cool. I think I think we're converging on language. <laughs> no, I don't think we were distant on concept, but I think we're converging on language. Yeah, I don't think we were far apart at all. But you know, I tend to use a sloppy language, and you've got a lot. Oh, so, do I. so do I. So do I. So do I. We've been we've been having these dialogues on both sides. Ian, do you recognize what you were saying and what I'm saying, or is that would you say it differently? Yes, I will say though it may still be an open question as to whether these micro frames can be assembled in an arbitrary manner or not. I I think my my intuition says that that you know it shouldn't be completely arbitrary, but the the idea would be to use simulated annealing to to test and verify this. Right, maybe have like a, a focus group somehow, um, but that's maybe later down the line. Ian, uh, uh, no, 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 no. This is really important. How do we combine frames? What, what are, what are? I've been thinking about frame composition a lot. The uh, and and I'm not saying I have the answer. Annealing for me is a bit crude as a way to do it, but maybe I don't understand what you have in mind. So maybe I don't. Uh, like, how would you combine frames so that annealing can be applied to it. But certainly the notion that certain, this frame being compatible with this frame, for me, that's a specific lens. It's entirely possible that for any two frames, there's many lenses that can translate one to the other. There may be more than one way to connect two frames with different metaphors. Uh, the, so, so a lens, a micro lens as a way to combine, to, to, to translate between two frames or to find correspondence between two frames. It's fine. The question is, what? I don't think. I think I agree with you. Not all frames can be combined. Uh, what frames are combined by whom? That's a cultural thing. Like we, you know, the culture has established that this frame can often be substituted for this frame in this way. Uh, can it be done arbitrarily? I doubt it. I'm sure there are also, quote unquote, anti lenses. We know we cannot translate this situation into that situation because there's also kind of constraint. That's not a lens, that's something else. There's a constraint that you cannot translate this as that. That's also cultural, that I don't know how to call it yet. Uh, what is the, is there a generic formula for this? I don't know. Is there, uh, I would just start with making sure that there's a good uh, tooling and language to express those translations so that we can experiment with modeling knowledge that way and see what's possible. You know, what is the data on socially accepted or socially frequent uh, frame translations? That would be my first step. Uh, the, the notion that frames are built of other frames, that's absolutely a fact for me. But again, which ones is, would I would treat empirically at this point rather than from first principles. But, I'm very curious about ideas about first principles. Well, you have, you know, measuring the uh, the history, which would be based off of frequency and that can lead to accumulated bias. Which so, is what I'm saying about social. Yeah, yeah so th there should also be some type of contrastive search to where you, you identify um, rarer frame transitions that, you know, still are, would be Absolutely. helpful, right? Emerging, emerging frame transitions, absolutely. This well, is why we need a corpus. It, it's like Amazon that, that studies rare words. And they use those as points of departure for what, what's going on here. Um, it, 
Ian, you surprised me. You, I, I, I did not see that coming. I, I, uh, 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 the other day you you started from a um, from a from a genome database thing and and went off into something else and I thought wow does he know biology where is uh, and then today you're talking about uh, annealing Boltzmann's you know and so we could we could begin to to throw in genetic algorithms and say look well, let's experiment which by the way is what Eurisco was about Eurisco was about doing. Uh, minor little variances on some frame structure, and then testing it to see how it how how held it how held how well it it held up in in the universe, and with that it it designed a three D VLSI platform and it uh, it uh, twice won a, a a naval warfare game, um, and and it's all by these little genetic tweaks to frame structures. And and maybe that's in in the middle of this mix as well. But I think that's kind of going off the rails in terms of of you know reading PubMed and turning it into useful information. It it's really great for for deep experimentation, and and we may actually discover new particle physics by doing it. But but uh, and this is actually fun. Well, thank you. I'd like to know more about you. That's uh, I, I, I don't know where you're coming from. Well, I used to be a Nazi, and I um, at one point radicalized somebody else online, um, and then the process to me de-radicalizing was was a very long one, and it did require personal experience and. A willingness to slowly experiment right there needs to be an environment that um i guess you know safe to fail probes right um but i i've i've played quite a lot of um war games when i was in high school world war ii games specifically so that's how i, I learned about history and political history um and I have a minor in mass communications. I, I took a, a course on bureaucratic politics under Dr. David Hedge at the University of Florida. And I have heard about the kind of fin framework before I um, I got really into the, the AI stuff when I took a course about media management and theory. The, the the professor she gave me an unsatisfactory because she said my my case briefs were too long. Uh, feel feel free to ask me specific questions because it's sometimes I'll I'll just start off at a specific point and and ramble. Uh, uh, I am sorry. We should have said this at the beginning. We normally record these meetings, and you're comfortable with that being on on record or not? We yeah, yeah. You can, you can if needed. You you can record okay. me. Fine. I mean, I don't okay. think you can. You know, and being a Nazi is, Look, is, is being... just, just a statement. What it tells me is that you have a deep and rich background that involved a huge, a huge amount of mental processes. And you had to go through the experiment of 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 this or that various political point of view, this or that point of whatever. And and the fact is, is you went over a peak and came to another side, whatever that side is, um, that's that's actually a, a, a really nice journey. I'm I being think judgmental, like, that's what I think. I think collecting people's narratives on how they've transitioned between ideologies or, or worldviews or, or ways of thought is probably the the starting point for a database for frame transition. Totally agree with that. And, and, and uh, we could sure use that today. Yeah, I I have a um in in the in the summit, the um working for a, a world it was like a it was hosted by the Barrett Kohler Foundation. I have posted a, a resource, two resources. Uh, one was a reflection on my former 
adherence to the red pill ideology. And that was a very um, adversarial view of relations between men and women, specifically sex as a measurement of worth. So their, their framing system was all about sex as a resource. And if you want to play the game, here, here's some things that you have to do. And then there's this, this framing of distrust and competition and sexual market value. And I, I have reflections about that. I can, um, I don't know if I can drop PDFs in, in the Zoom room or not, but I can also email that to people directly. I'll invite you to the Slack so you can add documents. Yeah. Um, you guys have a Slack? I don't think I'm... Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll invite you. I'll invite you. Okay. Um, um, and there's this Cambridge Core book about um, conversion narratives between extremists. So you have some jihadists, you have some Nazis, you have some, uh, some people who are involved with the Red Army faction in Germany. They were... Um, a Marxist group, and you also have um, some stuff on. I want to say anarchists in there, but it's it's a really fascinating read. I highly recommend. Um, but I was I was thinking, looking at the uh, the narratives between fascists and anarchists specifically, as an interesting starting point for the frame transition analysis. Um. But my, my idea for, for establishing a corpus at first was, well, there's already programs out there that can annotate frames automatically. They're not perfect, but they do an okay job. And if you're able to parallelize that at scale, you could establish a, a small corpus of maybe a couple hundred books or so um, that are sprinkled from the various ideologies and then you can try to find bridging points between those and see if it lines up with our personal experiences or or um, empirical evidence that that's a starting point but focusing on the conversion narratives directly would also be a valid path to take. Probably would save some time, but I don't know what you guys think. So the, the speech analysis would also be a good starting point. So in 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 the larger picture, how do we how do we lasso all of this back into the context of of CDL and, for example, the Society Library and the, and the mission to 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 uh, uh, to essentially map human dialogue. There's there's two so, things. There's mapping, and then there's sense making. Once you've mapped it, what do you do with it? And, well, I think the the sense making part comes from, in order to be open to dialogue, you have to not be close to it, and I. I from my intuition, there are certain constellations of frames that close people off from dialogue yep. and openness to new information, and specifically so, mapping that and then trying to test ways to break people from those fenced enclosures would be yep. the, the that's intertwined value. project. So finding like the... So like in the end, like it, it's nice to talk in abstract frames, but the idea would be like what types of speech or what arguments, like if I were to present yeah, something to somebody, um, what would I say given their context in order to make them more, more open-minded? Yeah, 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 I, exactly that. Um, from from the okay. context of say uh, national socialism or or extremist variants of, of religion um there's there's obviously oh you know we are we are right everybody else is wrong 
don't believe them. They're the enemy. Um, you know, boil everything down to an enemy. Your automatic assumption should be to distrust anything that goes against what we say. And we're going to have this frame of competition. And it's always like that. We'll, we'll downplay the significance of, of cooperation and instead, um, you know, devolve things to individual responsibility for the, the glory of some external greater thing. But um, communication must proceed down these very rigid, uh, separated lines of power, uh, separation of powers, divide and conquer. That's, that's uh, an example of a fenced in enclosure. And then to, to get somebody out of that, well, I think surveying people who who have made transitions in in one form or another, getting getting their narratives would would be the um, the starting point, the seeds, and you could use that to bootstrap and look for patterns. I, I think you mm -hmm. theoretically could start with just one, but you'll you'll want to um, collect as as many different ones as possible. I think. Because obviously people have the the different attentional priorities, um, and and these these heuristics of what frames are they are they biased towards? Because if you if you say oh, you know this this person is an enemy, and then you you associate a frame or a, a way of speaking with with that, you're um, constructing a uh, learned thought termination cliche so then how can you how can you bypass that so it's that that's that's the kind of thinking that i have okay this i totally totally agree with that uh the the if you're interested in that aspect i, I mentioned the how uh how minds change the, the book, um, it's a pop book, but it's an interesting pop book about techniques for mind change. And uh, one thing they say is arguments rarely work. Uh, what does seem to work up to a point is to help people reflect on their own, how they how they arrived at whatever position they're at. They're like, okay, what, what led you to that? And is, is that... Uh, do you think you know did everything fit that experience afterwards like but basically very non-judgmental asking how did you get there and and mm -hmm. making them realizing that makes them realize how contextual it is that it's narrower than even their whole experience yeah yeah because I, I, that, that that reminds me of uh motive or there's a an area um, of i think science or like a, a thing called motivational interview, lots of studies have been done about like formats of questions that help pull people to be able to change minds and whatnot. Um, so that might be interesting to look into if you haven't looked at that yet. Um, but again, it's focused on uh, asking questions, but also asking the right questions. Um, and what you were saying? Well, so there's there's understanding what framing to avoid when you're asking questions so that they don't automatically um, have that knee-jerk reaction that's been socialized into them. So that, that would be the, the word choice and then the narratives I think could help um, illuminate the, the types of questions that, that people ask themselves when they're reflecting on because their their beliefs actually are or or when they're evolving their beliefs because giving people the chance to to reflect also and in a non-judgmental way i think is very helpful yeah because if, if if people say oh i believe this and then they completely refuse to talk to you or or hear you out or even um, give you the chance of reflecting, then that does promote polarization, 
I would say. And uh, one thing that would be interesting, and I, I, um, so like you, you collect all these narratives um, and you have like, all right, uh, this situation led to change. Uh, and the, the, this is what was said to uh, at this point and this point and this point. Um, you could just make that into like an input to an AI model. Maybe that's kind of what you're suggesting. But like, here's a bunch of situations where someone's mind did change a bunch of situations where they didn't. Um, yeah. And you fine tune some sort of language model on top of that. But my, uh, to like help people uh, like create a language model to make open dialogue and help people be willing to change minds. Uh, but one thought yeah. there is, um, could that be misused for manipulation? Um, would that do more good or more harm? It really, that seems like the case or the question with like most of the AI stuff out there at the moment. <laughs> um, but like uh, changing people's minds isn't always good because um, you even mentioned you radicalized someone at one point. Um, and uh, like, and I, I know I've had my mind changed towards um, things I later realized was like, no, that's not what I should be thinking. Um, so that, that that's another thought is um, some of the ethical concerns of even making something like that. Yeah, that is a, a big question. Um, the meaning alignment people, they discuss this to some extent. Um, I guess the the main the main concern would be how are you sourcing the the situations or how are you framing the situations in the first place because if you if you constrain the problem set to a very narrow set of of circumstances say oh you know assume assume that everything is a zero sum game uh, assume that you know it's a matter of survival then obviously you'll you'll bias certain answers to appear in this um, collective wisdom sourcing process so having a um i guess deciding how how these complex problems are phrased or or who how or how many people get to ask questions and and have the order of the questions and, and how they're presented um how often the questions are asked that is probably is still an open question and implementing it in the ai means it becomes a tool of power as opposed of tool uh, of humans interacting and you know getting people to try to help one another yeah the the main use of the um the online ai tool wisdom survey thing would be to um scale a collective deliberation process um as for encouraging Which can be done without ai yeah it can be um and then then there's um the difficulty of okay, well, how do I develop social skills? Um, or, you know, if some, some people have different concepts of social skills and, you know, people also have maybe, I, I, I read somewhere, I heard somewhere that people have a constraint on the amount of close personal relationships that they can maintain. I think it was 200 or, or something. And bars number. Yeah, so I I don't know if uh, that has been revised since then or not. It has um, downwards severely. <laughs> so what what has it been changed to? Jack, you you're the one who often comes up with that statistic. Well, Dunbar studied large mammals like cows, and decided that 150 was the largest, give or take, plus or minus was the largest stable social network you can maintain. 
Now, never mind that your your LinkedIn probably has six hundred or seven hundred, and and people used to brag about millions on on MySpace, but one hundred and fifty for a stable social network. And in fact, I don't I don't even know most of them that are in my network on LinkedIn. But he's co-authored a paper in the last dozen years or so uh, that says it's really closer to six. And what he says is, look, you can go more than that, but you have to break them up. And so you end up with you end up with committees or guilds in World of Warcraft. Uh, World of Warcraft is, is the classic example of Dunbar at work. If they got more than 50 and there were only 10 roles to play, they would just split the guild and start over. Um, and and so, uh, yeah, it's just not a lot. I, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical of that, I must admit. Uh, the, when Snowden uses the numbers, he, he, he gives two different numbers. One is the kind of you know, tribal scale, people who know one another enough to basically to trust one another, to know whether to trust one another. Uh, and that is, you know, one to 200. It, some people are better at it than another and can go in the three, 400 range. Uh, I remember quoting Dunbar to my mother. It's like, I keep... Re serious relationship with 400 people i have to take notes but i do it <laughs> um, but on the other hand uh and my wife's mother probably knows more than that <laughs> the, on the other hand this is distinguished with a good team scale which is closer to six to twelve and after that really cut and maybe maybe lower than that that's, and there that's, that's it's really a different point. number it's a very different number. The, the people whom you can work as a team together is a very different psychological limit because you have to take ongoing count of all interactions on and a that's what constant we care basis. About. And, yeah. and see, when 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 you you, you I, I agree that in 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 less complex tribal societies, you know, that didn't have the internet and didn't have cars and freeways and telephone poles and so forth. Uh, you could you could easily keep track of, of of a very large tribe, but when it came time to dealing with things, the tribal council was rarely more than a dozen or so. Yeah, the, 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 but but yeah, but there is still something to be said to keeping things within a scale where you kind of know you kind of know people enough. Like in a in a bigger company, for example, teams will be small, but there's still the fact that until a certain scale, that's how um, the Velcro company works. They split after 150 following Dunbar's number. What that gives, what that does give you is that you're likely to know who to go to for any given problem, which is hugely yep. valuable. Yep. And that you can know at a much bigger scale than team size. And that's also an important number, basically. But yeah, the, the 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 who do you feel you know enough to have a clue you can trust them and what to count on them for? So uh, then, which the is, question is, how do you build trust at a systemic that, level, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> the, that the, is the question. <laughs> that is the question, and, and 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 how do you build trust when you have the reality that? Sometimes interests will diverge. The, 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 I've been reading a politicologist uh, called Chantal Mouffe. Uh, she's Belgian. Uh, she's worked a bit with Podemos, but she's you know one of those high flight political th theorists. And she's distinguishing uh, what she calls ag uh, agonism versus agonists versus enemies. And the idea is there are people who disagree with you who may have, you know, they may want to pull the blanket on their side, but they respect that they have to work with you in a process to negotiate. Yep. So for example, in, in traditional left-right politics, there would still be the notion that, you know, they will pull a bit on each our worldview, 
but we're still working within the confines of democracy and rule of law to uh, find something that's workable between us, as opposed to seeing the other as an enemy who threatens your existence uh, and who you have to eliminate to survive. Uh, and, and, and once you're in that dynamic, you're refusing to play the game and you're not part of the political, it's not a political process anymore, it's a military process maybe or something like that, but it's an en- it's a, it's an enemy process as opposed to an agonistic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, adversary, uh, uh, a respectful adversary relationship. But do you respect the other and are, are you willing to, enough to play the game with them, even if you disagree? And, and this is a different kind of trust. It's not trust that our interests will converge because maybe they won't, because people often will define themselves in contrast to someone else. And part of that is avoidable in human identity. But can you trust the other to play the, ray, the game honorably so that you're not uh, uh, degenerating into an illative conflict? That, that, I found that an, a useful distinction. Because, yes, trust is desirable and certainly want to work more on how can we have trust. And I think transparency is important. I think any political decision should come with full genealogy. Why was this decision taken? What was taken into account? What were which hypotheses, which alternatives were rejected and why? What was the rationale? This should always be attached to any decision in public, on a public database. That's my view about how to create trust in politics. I, uh, I agree with that. But you know, but it may not be enough because I mean it, no, it's not sorry. I think it's important. I think it's vital. There will still be conflict. But is it uh you know, political give and take conflict as opposed to a open conflict, which is a very different things. That was the point Muf was making. I think it's an important point. But that's it. Yes, we must maximize trust. And sometimes it means some decisions are taken based on very complex uh, or or expert knowledge. We have to accept that. Some people will say, this doesn't feel right. I mean, the Canadian economics is my favorite example. Very counterintuitive if, when you first encounter Canadian economics because it flies against the intuition you've built the, uh, dealing with your own budget. Uh, the, the, the individual local intuition is counter to the global ex- experience. And, and getting people to understand the global dynamics at play in Canadian economics requires learning a new way of thinking. It's not that complicated, but it's still, there's a learning hurdle. Uh, and getting people to be willing to say, you know, you've developed this intuition in a certain context. There's another context in which that intuition may not hold. That stuff. And, and, and getting, and there I think having a kind of database of what are the key metaphors that will help them realize Another intuition may be at stake in this other domain, because that's how we learn. Yeah. In 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 that that respect of of understanding the new situation, this is wildly off topic. But the fact is, is that New York Times is running a piece today about uh, um, how somebody managed to get a uh, Starlink. Um, um, console in 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 into uh, a very remote Brazilian tribe, and it's it's causing no end of problems. Interesting. My bad. But uh, I'm curious about this, but I I, I mean I, I can believe it. I've put a I've put a, a link and a and a an unpaywalled link in into uh, our Slack, and I put it into the OGM as well. Okay, good. Uh, but yeah. so in terms of building a working prototype for the frame analysis. How how quickly do you think we could make something like that? 
That's a good question. Uh, we've been at it for a long while, and uh, I think we've been a bit paralyzed by some some conceptual problems, some um, you know, uh, in a sense, how do we do this? Some I think one problem is we're all working on our own project. The projects are separate. Uh, one problem I've had is I've been trying to make boundary infrastructure, but some of it got on open source and I need to reopen source part of it. Uh, finding a way to all work on the same infrastructure to build things yes. is part of the issue. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm diff desperate to have a proper common database, common data format for that kind of stuff. So we can start building those corpuses uh, and build on those common corpuses. Most of us have their own projects and have their own projects. I mean, the CDL community is very much coming at it from an argumentation frames point of view, uh, pros and cons. Uh, and, and, and I'm so happy that you're bringing in the Lakoffian frame perspective in this conversation. I've been pushing for it for a while, but I'm glad I'm not alone doing it. I'm not, I have pushed frames in general, not Lakoffian frames in particular, but Lakoffian frames are brilliant, of course. Uh, I do think smaller frames, like more micro frames, are more likely to combine well upwards. I think but I may be wrong there. That's just an intuition. I think frame that is probably frame. too granular, and and you could probably pull pieces out of it and make them more, more micro. You're saying frame that is too granular? You mean too yeah. small, too micro? I, 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 I'm, I, what I mean is it's 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 not fine grained enough. Let me let me rephrase that. Oh, interesting. They they break out causality into about five categories, and there may be hundreds. Ah. The people the people that tried to use FrameNet in biology they ran into this, and so they you know they they added their own their own stuff. Yes, the the, the I think that. One thing I certainly don't believe in is trying to come up with a closed catalog of frames. And that's what FrameNet was trying to do. What I think is, what I, my way forward, instead of saying these are the frames and that's not, let's all use those frames, is be a bit more, let people define their own frames if they want to. And when they do so, give the lens that translate those frames to other frames so that people can say, okay, these are frames I understand and let's do the translation. So the, the lens has to be part of the model for me to allow frame experimentation. Uh, to say, you know, these are the frames I get, these are frames I don't get, and then be exposed to, listen, this frame is really useful and you should add, add it to your toolbox. Uh, that, that's that's a, that's the topic matting, mapping approach, which is, you know, you can define your frames in your topic map any way you want, but you've got to specify how I can read them and how I could merge with them. What kind of rules do you use for merging? And so you're, you, to me, you're describing a topic map mapper's issue. Well, with but, with transformers specifically, and all of these word embedding and encoding models that use relational data, uh, what what do they use to to update? I, I assume it's just the total combined usage and output from the internet, and m whether they're going off of frequency or not, I, I'm not entirely sure because I haven't studied those architectures too closely. But I imagine that there's a, a similar problem in that instance. The, 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 the big problem with 
neural network based architectures is you don't know what's going on. It's a bloody black box. We know that, as you said, they update from the whole net, but they have also to work hard to filter it, uh, to say, okay, we'll use this and not this. And they employ people, and that's very kind of a open secret, but they employ a lot of people to do a triage uh, of the data that they actually will use as a basis for training. And then sometimes they act, add training to an existing uh, weight set. Sometimes they retrain from scratch, but that is, that's expensive, of course. But the LLMs don't learn as such. They just uh, they get retrained with new data. Uh, but that's, you know, there's a big retraining event and then nothing, and then a big retraining event and then nothing. They don't learn anything from what they've done in between for one thing. That's one way in which neural net architectures are nowhere near us in terms of learning. What they can do is do more and more abstraction from all the data they are fed. Uh, there's also an observation that they do more and more poorly as uh, more and more the, of the data they fed may have been generated by previous iterations of LLM. That poisons the well uh, in terms of LLM learning. Uh, LLMs should never learn on their own data. And, and of course, their own data is now all over the place on the net, so it's harder to get good training data now. Um, and and my problem is, you know, as I said, I want every decision to be justified and have a genealogy of what were the reasons for this. You don't get reasons from an LLM. You can ask for reasons, but those are hallucinations as much as the the the, the advice. The, the advice it gives is basically a synthesis of what people in the training set have said. And the reason will also be an average of what the old training set have said, and sometimes that's good enough. And, but sometimes it's, uh, if it's a slightly off the beaten track problem, which whose terms were not exactly in the training set, then it will come up with something vaguely plausible as an answer and something vaguely plausible, but possibly completely disconnected as a reason. Uh, I find that concerning from the point of view of let's have trust in the decisions that were taken. So the the LLM in, in this instance um, that I'm describing would just be used to ask the the questions and then help the the um, the people that are being surveyed articulate their values or frames card or here are my attentional heuristics. That's fine, yes. The, the LLM as an interface to a data set, I'm perfectly fine with. Right. And it's a great to have a conversational interface to a data set, but we need to have a good representation for the knowledge graph and ideally a frame base so that it's understandable as such. Yeah, so, so that uh, this is the RAG game. Yeah. You're familiar with that, Ian? Uh, retrieval augmented generation. Yes. In other Sorry. words, in other words, they're they're fundamentally moving away from trying to use the stored domain knowledge of the LLM and use its 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 conversational acumen to reach out into other sources, resources, including computations now. Um, and, and, and so this is getting much closer to what I think is, is where we're going is, is, is that they, the idea of training it on all the world's internet words is, is useful in the following sense. It makes it kind of able to parse what you said and come up with something. But what now they're trying to do is get it to come up with a hook into a, a knowledge graph or a query uh, into into a database or whatever to give you a better answer, and that answer can come from all sorts of of uh, of of uh, with 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 a lot of traces. 
people so are beginning sounds, to drop oh sorry that sounds like what i'm I, i'm the llm in this situation maybe also um but yeah you can you can continue i, I just i just wanted to make that remark <laughs> there are ways in which we're llms i mean the, what i said about llms don't introspect and they don't know why they took a decision it's true of us up to a point um but just sorry this is supposed to be a one hour meeting we're 10 minutes over people are dropping off uh i think it's as good a time as any to close this conversation and now there's three of us and we were going to have a separate conversation and Maybe we're already way into it, but let's uh, close the CDL part of this.